this. You can't all make right, people. Right. You can't make people like you. You can't pass laws that make people like you. You can't do anything. You can only control yourself. So you try your heart. You try your hardest to achieve what you think you're supposed to achieve. But when you do find your true path, the universe will support you in that. Things will come together. You'll meet the people mm -hmm. you need to meet. They'll make the phone calls they need to make. You know, things will just fall into place, and that's right. a beautiful thing. So, so it sounds like. Today's episode of Two of Your Podcast. On today's episode, we had on the incredibly inspiring Jeffrey Gorey. He is a stand-up comedian, a comedy writer, a producer, an author. Man, this dude has done so much in his life. He has a YouTube web series called ComedyMatters.tv. He's also the author of the best-selling Amazon book, Heal Your Heart by Changing Your Mind. Uh, this was a wonderful episode, man. Uh, Jeffrey is actually, he interviews a lot of like comedians. So uh, he's done a lot of interviews with amazing people, man. I'm so happy to bring you this episode. Let's get right into it. Hey, all right. I am now on the line with a Mr. Jeffrey Gorian, who uh, you are a stand up comedian, a author, you're a dentist, you're a doctor, you're a comedy writer, you're a performer, you're a director, and you're a producer. Is that correct? <laughs> I got too many hyphens in my name. I think that's the problem, right? You are a man of, a, I guess I say, mini hats, right? Except I'll never wear a hat. That's the thing. Because of my hair, they don't make me wear hats. <laughs> that's I that's hats. Nah. So, uh, so check this out. You are, you are also the host of a web series, Comedy Matters TV, where you interview A-list comedians. Is that correct? Yeah, it's not a web series, really. It's it's a channel on YouTube. I just hit two million views, awesome. and. Uh, I have interviews with everybody from Jimmy Fallon and Chelsea Handler and D.L. Hughley and Mike Epps and uh, just on and on. Uh, Jim Carrey, Amy Schumer, Amy Poehler, even women not named Amy are on my channel. <laughs> I got everybody. You know, hey, I, it's awesome, man. I do a lot of red carpet stuff, so I get to interview uh, these people. A lot of them are friends, so I get to talk to them. Like Recently, we did the Garden of Laughs at Madison Square Garden. Okay. Can I assume that everybody knows about Madison Square Garden, no matter where uh, you live? I believe so. I think my artists would definitely know Madison Square. Yes, sir. Yeah, so Madison Square Garden's huge, like 20,000 people. And so they did an event called the Garden of Laughs, which is part of Garden of Dreams Foundation. They raise money for underprivileged kids and kids with disabilities. Hey, so hey. Tracy Morgan came out, and Bill Burr, and Jerry Seinfeld, and Ben Stiller and John Mulaney, of course. And so I get to interview them on the red carpet. That's awesome, man. It's really cool. Really that fun. Is. Really cool. That is awesome. I, I want to say um, you're also... I, I was going to say this. I know you were born in the Bronx, right? Bronx, New York? Yes, absolutely. I, I want to ask you, man. Uh, I want to get to you know, your whole comedy career and all that stuff, but I really want to know, man, what was your childhood like growing up in the Bronx, man? You know, it was very simple, kind of. The Bronx was, uh, and I don't know what you've heard about the Bronx, because okay. the Bronx has changed a lot over the years. Okay, so you know, These days, when it's in the paper, it's usually in the paper for crime and not such good stuff, you know? But there was a time when the Bronx was a very special place. And it was, you know, especially near where I lived. Uh, I lived in a really nice neighborhood, but very middle class, uh, if you played tennis, it was like playing polo, man. Like nobody, uh, <laughs> nobody did much. In hey. those you know, the big thing was like driving to Florida with your family. Uh, but it was really, it was really nice. It was a good place to grow up. Kids played in the street. It was safe. You could leave your door open. Uh, there was a real community. Okay. You know? Yeah. It was really, really nice. My dad was a, a liquor salesman. My mom was uh, a housewife. And in those days, women didn't need to work. You know, one person could pay all the bills. Right, right, right. It was a simpler life. If you don't, if you don't mind me asking, uh, where you were you born, Jeffrey? I do mind you asking because I never, 
don't, oh, then never mind. I don't own any age or any year. Once you okay. own an age, and I don't say that to be obnoxious, but what once you own an age, you're locked into that. You have oh. to do thing. And uh, I consider myself to be timeless. So okay, Jonah. Talk about age. You know, it's not a, it's not relevant to this because it's it's very hypothetical. It's it's based on when your parents got together. You know. Sure enough. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It happened at any time. So, you know. I definitely, I definitely understand that. I just kind of flow with it. Okay. And, uh, but just leave it to say that it was a nice childhood. I had a I had a great family. My parents were very cool. Had a great sense of humor. That's how I got turned on to comedy. My dad used to take me to comedy movies all the time. He had a wonderful sense of humor, as did my mom. They were both very supportive in anything that I wanted to do. That's awesome. And I have uh, a younger sister, too, named Ronnie, and she's really cool. Okay, that's awesome. I'm curious, man. Um, I guess, do you have any, uh, I guess, any, any childhood memories where you think that that's kind of like what shaped you, who you are today? Well, I was already writing comedy when I was 12 years old. Okay, you started young. I was a very sensitive kid, and I knew that I wanted to be a doctor of some kind. But I already knew that I couldn't handle life and death situations. My sensitivity overwhelmed me. And I know that you usually talk to dancers, you know, and and but all artists have the same depth of feeling. Artists experience the world in a very different way than most people. In order to be an artist, you have to be in touch with your sensitivity. And when you're a kid, when you're a kid, sensitivity can feel like a burden instead of a strength. It can feel like a weakness because most people don't understand it. And it's it's difficult growing up that way. So I knew I wanted to be a doctor, but I couldn't, I knew I couldn't handle life and death. So I decided I wanted to be uh, a dentist, uh, originally an orthodontist, because I like going to my dentist. And okay. I like the fact that he could make people's teeth straight and, and give them a beautiful smile. And so I thought that, that's, that, that that was what I wanted to do. And I was already writing comedy for the amusement of my friends. Okay. I'd write crazy stories and show it to them and everybody would laugh. And, but I never considered show business as a career, mm. which was interesting because my grandfather owned a nightclub. And it was a very popular nightclub in the Bronx in those days. And uh, as a matter of fact, years later, when I met very famous comedians like Milton Berle, who is known as Mr. Television, and who turned out to be my sponsor in the Friars Club, uh, he knew of the Red Mill. And so did a lot of the comedians of his generation, which they call the golden age of comedy. Okay. You know, so it was very cool. So I was exposed to show business at an early age because... um, it was entertainment people and gangsters used to hang out. <laughs> so no. <laughs> so I wanna, uh, it was interesting. I, I want to ask you this, man. Um, I got a couple questions, man. Um, what's the difference between it an orthodontist and a dentist? Are, are they the same thing, or? No. Um, an orthodontist straightens teeth. Oh, so okay. So you have to become a dentist. You have to graduate from dental school, to and then you specialize. Oh, and okay. To become an orthodontist, you have to go into a program after you graduate from dental school that can last, I think, two to three years okay. in professional study. And then you and then once you become a specialist, that's all you can do. Once you become uh. once you become an orthodontist or an oral surgeon or any of the specialties, a periodontist who works on gums, uh, you can't do anything else anymore. You can't go back and start doing fillings. Really? Stick to your specialty. Oh wow! So I used to have braces, so I I, I went to see an orthodontist when I got my braces. Yeah, yeah, sure enough. And that was all he could do. If he if you needed a filling, he'd have to send you back to your general dentist. Okay, okay. I'm curious, man. Um, you, I you say you wanted to. I guess what made you want to become a dentist was it just like your desire to help people, or yeah. Well, I and then I changed. I became a cosmetic specialist. I never oh. became an orthodontist. I became a, a cosmetic dentist which was a very new specialty when I started. I was always fascinated with beauty and making people look their best. And so I was very involved. Uh, I used to uh, lecture on cosmetic dentistry, where some, some cases would take eight hours. I would work on somebody for eight hours straight to take crooked teeth and make them look perfectly straight. Okay. It's a cosmetic technique called cosmetic bonding. 
And I was one of the first to do that. I did a lot of, you know, I took broken teeth and put them back together again. Oh, wow. Front teeth that were broken in half. Yeah, okay. Teeth that broke off and I bonded it back in place. And I used to do a lot of stuff like that. And I used to lecture the different companies on my techniques. Okay. So I really enjoyed what I was doing. Okay, that's awesome, man. I, um, that, that's actually very impressive. I'm curious, man. Um, what what was it like for you learning dentistry? You know, was that something? Did you, that something you enjoyed or not really? It was the hardest four years of my life. It was a okay, very wow. difficult time because not only is it hard, but the people in the school where I went were very unfriendly. I had a very oh. negative, very negative experience. I was um, I was exposed. You know, it should have been an honor to be accepted because it, it was a very famous school. And I don't know that I should name the school yet, but it was a very well-known school. And um, it should have been an honor to be accepted. The doctors there should have welcomed you. But in those days, the mentality was like it was like a four-year fraternity hazing. And uh, I grew a mustache and I was banned from school for having a mustache. What you have on your lip? Uh -huh. I was not allowed to go to school for three weeks. Oh, wow. They wanted me to drop out of school because I grew a mustache. These days, that would never fly. Of course. You wouldn't be able to do that to anybody. But in those days, uh, I was literally banned from school. And some of it, I, I truly believe, was anti-Semitism. Wow. Um, it, was, it was a very... It was a terrible time for me. I was subjected to humiliation and... Like one day, you know, when you learn to give injections, you have to give injections to a patient. That's how you learn. And I was always very careful. I would use a lot of topical anesthetic to numb the gum first to make sure they didn't feel the needle. And I had a needle in the patient's gum. And one of the instructors came by and purposely hit my elbow and said, put the needle in further, which is really assault. If yeah. That happened, if that had happened these days, they would be arrested. But in those days, people got away with all kinds of stuff. That's intense, and man. So it was a very difficult four years for me. But you know what? I decided that no one would ever get the best of me. That's when I really became very strong because my, okay. parents, my parents were very supportive. And they said, you could drop out if you want to. And I go, I will never drop out because I'll never let somebody like that get the best of me. That's awesome, man. And I graduated in the top of my class. I graduated number 54 out of 126. Okay. Even, even though they tried to stop me. Yeah. I, and for the stupidest reason, for the stupidest reason, because I grew a mustache. Can you imagine that? Ah, oh, man, it's crazy. It's crazy. It's absolutely, it makes no sense. Even saying the story to you sounds insane to me. That people, you know, because the school was filled with pictures of the founders of the school who all had beards and long sideburns in those days. It was like 1800s. Everyone had, you know, long hair and, 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 and heavy beards. But in these days, it was, it was not considered a, like being like a doctor. The dean, a the dean actually made a speech on the opening day of school. He said, we don't want any free thinkers here. He said, if you want to be a hippie with a guitar, go to dental school in California. Okay. That, was the, that was the first day of school. So that kind of set the tone. Yeah. Well, was that was that more so? I guess like um, you know, an image thing. They didn't want doctors to be to be perceived a certain way. Is that what it yes. was? Yeah, it was that phony thing. You know, like so these yeah. days, I taught at NYU for many years. You know, after I stopped practicing, I I was a teacher at NYU in oral medicine and orofacial pain, and you should see the students are all tattooed and pierced mm, right. and long hair, and they look like modern people. Right. And NYU doesn't say anything. I was, you know, I was shocked because of what I had to go through uh, in school. I and mean, I, it shows you. I was in Philly. That's what I'll say. I went to Philly, which you would think would be more advanced, but it was not at all. Okay. So, but, I, but as I said, it taught me a good lesson that I, I don't let any obstacle stand in my way. When I want to achieve something, I persevere and I go through it and I... I make sure that I get what I want. You know? Awesome, man. Let me ask you this. I want, a, I want a toy truck. What? With Santa Claus. Oh, oh, hold on one second, Santa Claus. I got, I'll be right back. Uh, hey, if you could leave a like and subscribe for the show, that would be amazing. 
Uh, let's get back to the episode. You know? Awesome, man. Let me ask you this. Um, for people out there right now who might be, you know, who might be facing obstacles and struggling with obstacles, what, what advice can you give them? Stay strong, you know. You, you, if you believe in yourself, you know, like, everyone thinks, well, everyone has a path in life. And this is kind of a very spiritual approach, but um, you're supposed to try and do what you think you're supposed to do. And if you can't get it, if all the doors seem closed to you, it's because the universe is giving you a message that maybe you should try something else, something yeah. different. It's not that you're being punished. It's not that you're the ultimate victim of the universe. But it, but it may be that you're supposed to have something better than what you thought you wanted. So you keep trying. You do the best you can. You can't micro manipulate the universe. You can't make right, people. Right. You can't make people like you. You can't pass laws that make people like you. You can't do anything. You can only control yourself. So you try your heart. You try your hardest to achieve what you think you're supposed to achieve. But when you do find your true path, the universe will support you in that. Things will come together. You'll meet the people mm -hmm. you need to meet. They'll make the phone calls they need to make. You know, things will just fall into place, and uh, that's a beautiful thing, man. So, so it sounds like, um, uh, am I wrong to say that you're you're an optimist? Yeah, absolutely. I'm an optimist, despite the fact that I've had many things that did not work out. Uh, I go through life optimistically, always thinking. You know, there's this crazy saying. It says, uh, "Insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, always expecting exactly. different results." Exactly. But to me, I look at it in another way that you can try things up to a certain point. You have to be realistic, you know, but there have been many cases throughout history, especially with inventors who tried thousands of things until they found something that worked. And the thing that worked changed history. It changed the universe, you know. Persistency, so, yeah. yeah. So if you really believe in yourself and you think you've got something going on, whether it's in medicine or something artistic, if you're talented and you know you're talented and you're looking at yourself with a true vision, you know, all you have to do is watch shows like America's Got Talent and you see people who think they're talented, <laughs> but they're not that talented, you know? But if you really have something going on, you gotta stick with it because not everybody's gonna like what you do. But if you like what you do and, you know, like, or, in comedy, you know, I'm at open mics all the time. I'm watching new comedians. Some of them are horrible. There's some great talent out there, but these days everybody thinks they're a comedian. You know, they tell three jokes at a party because their friends tell them they're funny. They think they're a comedian. So every city across the, the country has a comedy club. Of course, filled, of course. Filled with people that are convinced that they're comedians, you know. Meanwhile, all a lot of them are talking about is going to the bathroom, which is not that funny. You're supposed to, you're supposed to outgrow that when you're nine. Uh, you know? let, me, let me ask you this. Let me ask you this real quick. For, um, so say you are bad at something. You know, is it, should you just, just keep practicing right until you get better at it? Or like, at what point do you, you know, change, change your course, change your plans? That's a very interesting question because... A lot of comedians, and, you know, I'm friends with some of the top comedians. They all say that they bombed when they first started. Mm. You know, there's, there's a famous story about Ray Romano, who was in one of my early books. You know, um, I did a book that Chris Rock wrote the intro to, and it's called Make Them Laugh. All and right. it's the history of the comic strip, a very famous comedy club in New York City, where Eddie Murphy started, and that's where he discovered Chris Rock. And Jerry Seinfeld came out of there, Ray Romano, Colin Quinn. So many big stars came out of that club. And it's still open today after over 40 years, you know. It opened in 1976. So they all talk about bombing. Ray Romano started his career, believe it or not, under the name Jackie Roberts. Okay. And the reason he did that was um, in, the, in those early days, there were only three comedy clubs in New York City. The very first one was called The Improv, which opened in 1963. Before that, there was never such a thing as a comedy club. Wow. Comedians performed in nightclubs. They performed um, in other type of venues. But there was no club that was dedicated to comedy. So a man named Bud Friedman changed all that by opening up The, uh, the Improv, which now exists only in Los Angeles. 
And then a guy named Rick Newman, uh, Rick Newman opened up a place called Catch a Rising Star. And then the third club was the comic strip that opened on June 1st in 1976. And on June 17th, Jerry Seinfeld came in to audition. And that was his, his home club for the first four years of his career. Mm. And so, so uh, Ray Romano went to the improv and they had a lottery. Because uh, so many people wanted to perform, they couldn't let everybody perform. Right, so right, right. you got to put your name in a hat. And if they picked your name, you got to go up on stage. So to double his chances, he brought a friend with him. But he couldn't find a guy. He brought a girl with him. So he said to her, listen, you can't use a girl's name because I can't go up under a girl's name. you got to pick an androgynous name. Right. So she picked the name Jackie Roberts. And, of course, that thing got picked. They, they, they picked Jackie Roberts, and he went up on stage as Jackie Roberts, and he passed the audition. Nice. So now we had to perform as Jackie Roberts because he couldn't tell the owner that he was lying about his name. Fair <laughs> enough. So that she wouldn't let him perform. So for the first two months of his career, he performed under the name Jackie Roberts. And then the way he told it to me, he said, and one night he bombed, and he bombed so horribly. He said, in the beginning, he was doing well, like beginner's luck. But one night he bombed so bad that he didn't go back on stage for two years. Wow. Yeah, he went back to selling futons because that was his business before. His best friend had a futon business. And that's what he went back to do. But it was weighing on him for two years. He couldn't, he, he knew he had to go back to comedy. And so two years later, he came back and he went to the comic strip. But now he came back as Ray Romano. And that's what made his career. That's how he started. And that's, that's the cool. club. That's where he met his manager, who is his manager to this day, a guy named Rory Rosegarten. They've been together all the, like 30 years they've been together. So... It just shows that you can start out bombing and still right. be a huge star if you think you have it. Okay. You got to so be realistic. True. You got to be realistic, though. Mm. Okay, I understand that, man. I definitely understand that. I want to ask you this, man. Um, so you tell me about, you know, your, your dentistry and everything. So you, yeah. you, you, you graduate from uh, you know, dentistry, and then do you go straight into, um, what was it, uh... Into practice? Yeah, yeah, I guess into practice, yeah. Or... No, what I did was I worked in bad neighborhoods for a couple of years. I, I always liked treating underprivileged people. And so I worked in Medicaid offices for about two and a half years. And I worked in some pretty rough neighborhoods. But I got along so well with the people because they knew that I really wanted to help them. And I treated them the same as you would treat somebody in a private practice. And they really appreciated that because in a lot of these clinics, they don't get great care, you know. And a lot of the doctors, I, I, I hate to say it, but the care is just not that great. But I, I used to order the most modern stuff, and I, I had a great time there. I treated these people really well, and they used to make sure I was safe. They'd walk me to my car at the end of the day okay, to make yeah, sure yeah, that yeah. nobody messed with me, you know. And I did that for two and a half years. I worked all over the South Bronx and I ran offices for people so that I could get experience. Mm -hmm. And then after about two and a half years, I had an opportunity to buy my own practice. Oh, right. And I bought a practice from a man who was, uh, he was, he was a youngish man who had a terminal illness. It was very sad. And he had built this practice up. It was a very big practice and he wanted someone to take it. That was kind of like him in a way, like, and I was newly married at the time, and he met me and my wife, and he liked us, and he said, I would like you guys to have it. So I bought the practice from him, and it was really challenging because he was an experienced dentist. He had been a dentist for about 30 years, so he was doing a lot of very complicated work that I had to finish. Oh, wow. I only had two and a half years' experience, so it was a really great learning experience for me. Uh, because I had no choice. A lot of these people were in the middle of cases and they had paid for them and I wow. had to finish them. And I looked so young, I expected the people the people to say, like, where's your dad? You know? <laughs> like, <laughs> like, I looked really young because I was only, I was like 25 when I went into practice. So, uh, but I did it. I finished all the cases. All the people were happy. I learned what I needed to learn. I worked so hard, man. I was working seven days a week. I believe it, yeah. And I, 
because I, I was dedicated to making sure that everybody got what they were supposed to get. Mm -hmm. And I wanted it to turn out really good. So I learned under fire, as they say. I, exactly, I, yeah. Really hard. Yeah. And it, and it turned out well. And so I'm curious, man, during, during this whole time, you know, of you owning your practice and doing the industry, were you still doing comedy at that time? Yeah, I was writing for big stars, man. I okay. was writing for Rodney Dangerfield and Joan Rivers and uh, Jerry Lewis. Long list of comedians yeah. that I was writing for the Friars Roast. You know, the Friars Club were famous for their roasts. For many years, they were secret. They weren't televised. And in, in, in more recent years, they had a deal with Comedy Central to publicize the roasts. I, I remember those. Yeah, the roasts were always really raunchy, you know. Dean Martin, Dean Martin did a take on them on regular television, and they did very clean roasts. Mm. Dean Martin roasts were always, of course, they were clean, because in those days, there was no cable TV. You had to work clean if you were going to be on television. Right, right, right. So all comedians had a clean act, you know. Uh, again, because there was no cable. These days, anything goes. You could say whatever you want. But in those days, you had to be clean. So Dean Martin did this series of roasts. Uh, but the Friars Club were always very special roasts. That's where it all started. And I was the main writer for about 12 years. That's awesome, man. Yeah, so that was really cool. And I got to work with some great people. I got to work with Bruce Willis for his roast and Jerry Lewis for his roast. That's how I met Jerry. Who, okay. Who died not too long ago, at like 90 years old. You know, a lot of these... Old time comedians, they lived to very old ages. You know, George Burns was 100, Milton Burl, I think, was 93, uh, Henny Youngman was 91. You know, um, there's something about laughter. Oh, man. It seems to keep people young. I believe it. You know, when you yeah. laugh a lot, it releases endorphins, the pleasure chemicals, you know? Yeah. They call it dose. It's like dopamine, oxytocin, serotonin. And endorphins, the pleasure chemicals. Right, right. What happens when you laugh? So when you go through life with a positive attitude, it helps you to stay healthy and it helps you to stay young. Believe it. I definitely believe that, man. I, I'm curious, man. Um, oh, I remember reading that you uh, you also got to work with Woody Allen. Is that how did you meet him during that time? He was my inspiration. Yeah, I. Uh, it's a crazy story. I wanted to meet him. There were only three people I ever wanted to meet. I don't know. As a young kid, I had these dreams of meeting certain people. So I wanted to meet Woody Allen, Salvador Dali, and the Beach Boys. Okay. And I got yeah. to meet them all. That's awesome, man. That's so now, cool. I used, to think, I used to think that I could make anything happen that I wanted to happen. That's how I grew up thinking. I, and now that I say it, it sounds strange, but... But that's how I really felt. That okay, that's awesome. That's a, that's a great mindset, though. That I needed to meet these people. So uh, Woody Allen was in a play at the time called Play It Again, Sam, on Broadway with Tony Roberts, who was in so many of his uh, projects. And I was still in dental school. And so I didn't have much money in those days, and I couldn't come home too often. But when I did, I would I would drop by the theater and I would leave him a little note on the back of my dental school card as if I knew him, like as if we were friends. And I would say, hey, Woody, it's Jeffrey and I'm going to come and see you soon. And I said, you know, and I would just leave these messages fairly constantly whenever I'd come into town. And then I guess I saved up enough money to get tickets. And I knew that you had to like if you're going to meet a big star. You have to convince them that you're sane. I mean, right. st stalking wasn't a big thing in those days, but most men don't go to the theater hoping to meet other men afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> if you're a pretty girl, you got a better shot at it. Right, know? right, right. So I had this concept. Well, the only way to show the guy that you're sane, you either wear a tie or you bring a pretty girl with you. And I didn't have a tie. <laughs> And I only knew one pretty girl, and she hated me. We had just broken up, right? <laughs> All right so then. But, but she knew that my dream was to meet Woody Allen. So I begged her. I'm like, please come with me, because we're going to meet Woody. I got tickets, and we're going to go, and it's going to be great. And so she agreed to come with me, right? So I show up, because in those days, I didn't have the confidence to go on my own. you know. And that's another lesson that I learned, that it's not about who's on your arm. It's about you. You know, like people would invite me to things and I would always think I had to bring somebody special with me. 
And there's nothing wrong with that either. But you got to have the confidence to show up on your own, you know. Aye. So, Aye. so uh, I go to the theater with her, and I leave my final note with the doorman, Woody. I'm here, and I'll come back to see you during intermission. I didn't even know. I had no knowledge. I didn't know you wait till the end of the show. I tell the guy I'm coming back during intermission. So intermission comes, and I'm I'm so nervous. I'm ready to 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 not do it. I wanted to back out. And she's like, no way. I came with you. You got to go and do this. So I go to the stage door. And again, in those days, there's no terrorist. There's no stalking. Oh, we walk okay. with kid. And the stage manager was not in his seat. So I grab her hand and I run up these stairs. I see it like it was yesterday. And I went the wrong way. I went up to the roof. You know? So <laughs> there was a staircase. <laughs> so I come back down. And the stage manager is there. And he goes, can I help you? And I say, yeah, Woody's expecting me. And he goes, go right in. Wait, you play the part. Oh, man. I had the confidence, man. I say, go right in, right? So I go to his dressing room, and it's empty. He's in Tony Roberts' dressing room with the entire cast. Now I'm in a panic. And she's like, Jeffrey, you got to do this. You cannot back out. Hey. So I go up to the door. And the whole cast is in there. And I swear to God, I could see this like it was yesterday. He's sitting on a couch on the other side of the room. And I peek in the door and I go like this to him. Like, a <laughs> like this. And he goes like this to me. He goes like this. Me? And I'm like, yeah, like this. So he comes over and he's actually holding my card. Nice. That's and awesome. He says to me, you must be Jeff, right? And I was like, I went nuts in my head. I like, I'm, 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 and I started saying stupid stuff to him, like, uh, let's open up a day camp and throw winter clothes at people. And I said, uh, let's walk low like we used to in Europe. And he, he looks at the girl I'm with. Uh, I don't know what kind of language you use on your podcast, but he goes like, this guy's an effing nut. Because I, <laughs> and I realized I was overreacting, right? I was so excited to meet my idol. Yeah. Right? So... I, so I said to him, you know, I calmed down a little bit. And I said, look, I'm a comedy writer. And I, everyone says that my stuff is so similar to yours, you know. And I was hoping that I could meet you and that you would read my stuff. And he goes, well, listen, I'm right in the midst of the show. Because right, right. Do, you, do you think you could come back tomorrow night? Right? And I was like, no, I'm much too busy. No, I was like, of course, I'll come back tomorrow night. Right? <laughs> well, back tomorrow night. So he made arrangements. He left tickets for me. I come back the next night and I beg the same girl to come with me. I'm like, uh -huh. you got to come. And she gave in. And it was a, a stormy, rainy night, as I remember. I borrowed my father's car because I didn't have a car in those days. I borrowed my father's car and pick her up, get to the theater. And after the show, he spent a lot of time with me. We sat in his dressing room and he read every little thing. I didn't even have scripts. I had little scraps of paper with ideas on them. And he looked at them all and he said to me, you know what? Your stuff is really very visual and you should think of making a film out of it. Oh. Now, my, my dream was that he was going to say to me, Jeffrey, you're amazing. and We should make movies together. Yeah. But that didn't happen. But, but he spent all this time with me and he said, he, you know, he encouraged me to go ahead. He said, it's very visual. And I took those ideas and I wound up making a series of films out of them mm. that that were in a, a comedy festival some years later called the Toyota Comedy Festival. And they showed them at Caroline's Comedy Club on Broadway in New York. And it was called the Men Who Series. It's still on my YouTube channel. Okay. And it's about men who do very unusual things, like men who take a pitchfork to the movies. Okay. <laughs> men who enjoy Latin dancing with tools. Like, I, I have a guy... <laughs> I have a guy who did the tango with a wrench, man. That was un <laughs> You may have seen a lot of la Latin dancing with tools, but not like these guys. All right. <laughs> he did the merengue with an extension ladder. That was unbelievable. All so, right. That's crazy. So I did this whole series of crazy films, and it was because of his inspiration. Now, years later, I became friendly with his managers, Jack Rollins and Charlie Jaffe. If you look at the end of any of Woody Allen's movies, it always says produced by Rollins and Jaffe. Oh. And Jack Rollins passed away maybe two, three years ago at 100 years old. Charlie Jaffe left us before. 
But both of them became friends of mine. And Jack used to say to me, that story is amazing. Woody must have really seen something in you. Because yeah. it, he says it wasn't like him to do stuff like that, to invite you to come back the next night and sit with you and read all your stuff. And so years later, I wrote a movie called I Am Woody. I know, but yeah, yeah, the one about the mob boss, right? About a mob boss who's obsessed with Woody Allen. And he, he survives a mob hit, and he comes out of it with amnesia. And now he really thinks he's Woody Allen, but he's six foot five and 300 pounds. Yeah. But he's like a huge Woody Allen. He, he doesn't know he's that big. He thinks he's small and thin. Okay. So he, he becomes afraid of his own men. Oh. And he won't go with them. They have to get him to go to a sit down. And in order to get him to go, they tell him they're taking him to a, a meeting to raise money for his new movie. Yeah. And that's how they get him to go. So I sent the script to Jack Rollins. And he calls me up and he goes, this script is so great. He goes, you know, he goes, there are lines in here that Woody could have written himself. Okay. And I said, could you show it to him? And he said, no, I can't. And I was like, why not? And he couldn't really explain it to me. He goes, there's a reason that I can't do it. He goes, but I think you're incredibly talented. He goes, how come I never managed you? And I was like, listen, that's such a compliment, but I don't know if, if I should be happy or jump off my terrace. Right. <laughs> because you could have managed. I didn't know to ask you that. You know, I mean, uh... it was such a great honor that that man would say that to me. How come I never managed you? But at the time, he was already retired and it was too late. Uh... And so he talk about being disappointed. It was a great honor for him to say that, you know, but it was too late. So that's what happens in life sometimes. You come very close to things, you know, but it was amazing that Woody was the one who actually inspired me to continue going on. Okay. And so, you know, then I met all these other people. I met Salvador Dali and I met the Beach Boys and I did it all, you know. When I met Salvador Dali, it was because I was driving what I could only describe as a pimp mobile. Okay. I don't know if you've ever seen those, but what kind of car was it? It was a it was a, a Cadillac El Dorado. Okay. Yeah, and yeah, in those yeah. days in New York, only the pimps drove cars like okay. that. And I had met a guy from <laughs> it sounds so strange. I had met a guy from Maryland, uh, who was a pimp who was driving like a gold El Dorado with a clear bubble over the driver's seat and a clear bubble over the passenger seat. And I was very impressed with his lifestyle. So I'm like, this is a car I got to get. So I went, <laughs> I went to a place and they said, we have one car and it was made for one of the Isley brothers, but he decided not to take it. And I bought it and I put a Rolls Royce grill on it. Oh, wow. Way before, way before MTV did Pimp My Ride, you know? Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I had this car, it had big white wall tires, like the big white Lifesaver tires. And I put these luggage straps on the back the car was amazing hey. and and i trust me when i say i was the only white guy that ever drove a car like that right <laughs> and so years later when i yeah and, and oh and patrice o'neill loved it when i told him about the car because i used to be his co-host on a show called the black phillips show and his theme song was the song bitch better have my money yeah i remember it but it was the original from 1991 amg not the mm -hmm. one that Rihanna did. It was the uh, original. I don't know if you know that older song. I, I definitely I know it from the Bashisa, so I definitely know the song. Well, you gotta check. Yeah, it's a it's a crazy song. So he used to like that. He goes, Jeffrey, you're the only white man I ever met who knew all the words the bitch better uh, have money. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I used to drive this car and wherever I went, it would get a lot of notice. Okay, of course, of course. That without people without people noticing. Cops would follow me, hookers would check out the car. It was it was crazy. And so, and so I, I just want to make sure uh, you were a dentist driving that car. Is that right? I had doctor's plates on the car. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and so and my wife is like, uh, we're Jewish and we live in the, the suburbs. Why am I driving an orange Cadillac? Yeah. I'm like, you don't get it. You don't get it. <laughs> you don't get, obviously, you don't get it. So it was an amazing car. I still have pictures of the car. It was incredible. I don't get it. <laughs> so, so, uh, I knew that Salvador Dali stayed in a hotel near me when he came. Well, I wasn't living in the city then. I was living in Westchester. But I knew that he stayed in a hotel on the east side of town when he came to New York. And I found out that he was coming in. So I pulled up in that car 
When you pull up in that car, everybody notices. Right. And I threw the doorman a few bucks, and I said, watch my car. Salvador Dali is expecting me. And he's like, you're in luck. He just went in. Jeez. And I was like, okay. So now, but I'm still like a kid in my mind. So I go up to the desk and I say, what room is Salvador Dali in? They're like, well, we can't give that information. I didn't realize that you can't just ask for somebody's room. Right, right, right. So I go back out to the doorman and I say to the guy, are you sure he just went in? Because I called him and nobody answered. And he's like, well, are you sure you called the right room? Like room 1023? And I'm like, I'll try it again. So I go back in. And now I got the room and I call up. And he answers the phone. I thought I'd have to go through 10 people to get him, right? So he's on the phone. So I tell him, first of all, I realized he's not going to remember if he ever met me or not because he meets right. so many people. And there's no way that I could out crazy Salvador Dali. No matter what I say is going to be good, right? So I tell him that we met before, that I was a surrealistic dentist. And then I put the back teeth in the front and the front teeth in the back. <laughs> and I... He didn't say anything. All he said to me was Sunday night, seven o'clock. And he hung up the phone. Sunday night, seven o'clock, right? So I took that as an invitation that he wanted me to come and meet him Sunday night, seven o'clock. So Sunday night, my wife's like, where are you going? I said, I'm going to meet Salvador Dali. <laughs> and she said, are you serious? I said, no, really? He invited me down. I show up at the hotel. And I sit in front of the elevator, waiting for him to come down, wondering whether I'm going to recognize the man. Now, I don't know if you ever saw pictures of Salvador Dali. He's got that mustache. The mustache that went up to his eyes. How can you not recognize the man? Right, right, right. right. He's sitting there, it's August. He comes out of the elevator wearing a full length mink coat. Uh. Mustache up in the air, carrying a gold, uh, a jeweled walking stick. Oh, wow. So I walk up to him, and I, for some reason, I start speaking to him in Spanish. Huh. I'm not sure why, but I, just, <laughs> I start speaking to him in Spanish because he's Spanish. And, and I introduce myself, and he acknowledges me, and then totally ignores me. We're walking down this corridor because he used to meet people in this place called the King Cole Lounge. So I'm walking next to him in this corridor, and he's totally ignoring me. He just goes from being very friendly, saying hello, to like like I'm not even there. And I'm embarrassed, right? I'm like a little puppy next to him. Right, right. But he's not answering me. We get all the way into the King Cole Lounge, and we get to his table. And all of a sudden, he puts his arm around me and starts introducing me like I'm his son. Like, this is Jeffrey. I want you to meet Jeffrey. And he went from not acknowledging my existence at all to introducing me to everybody. All these okay. people are here to meet him. And he told me where to sit. He had me sit right next to him. And Geraldo Rivera was there that night with uh, some socialite. I don't remember exactly who it was. And a long table filled with people. I sat next to a, a French dwarf who had a very big portfolio of artwork. Okay. And it was a very unusual group. A girl who had basketball weights tied around their arms and legs. <laughs> Everybody had an unusual story. And I spent the entire evening with him, and then he invited two people to go out for dinner with him. I was hoping it was going to be me, but it was Geraldo Rivera, who okay. was not famous then as he is now, you know, and was in later years. But years later, when I met Geraldo again, we shared that story, and he remembered that night. It was a crazy, oh. and he wound up going out to dinner with Salvador Dali. And I didn't have a camera with me in those days. There was no cell phones. Nobody had right, right. cameras then. I don't have a picture of it, but it's indelibly etched in my of mind. Of course. I'll never of course. that night. It was a crazy night. Hey. And it was thanks to that car. Hey, okay, so sure enough, so sure enough. Well, I've heard about the two people. I got to hear about the Beach Boys then. Please tell me about how you met them. You know what? That story is less clear. <laughs> All I remember about that is standing at, I'm pretty sure it was Carnegie Hall, standing at the back door and waiting for clearance. And I was with my wife at the time, and uh, I don't remember how I did it or what I did, but we had to stand there and wait, and then I remember them saying to me, you can go up now, and we went up going backstage with the Beach Boys, and one, and one of them liked my wife. <laughs> <laughs> okay. he, was, 
he was like, she was wearing like this fur coat and he was really checking her out. And it was, that's all I remember that we hung out with them for pretty much of that evening, but backstage. Okay. So I don't remember what I did to lead up to it. All I remember is that I never let anything stand in my way. No, no. I to do something. I made yeah. it. Okay. And I, I want to, um, yeah, I want to, you already talked about, but tell me how you, uh, how did you meet Patrice O'Neill, man? Please tell me about that. Well, I, uh, I've been covering the comedy scene. Besides being a performer and a comedy writer and this, I'm like a comedy journalist. And I started writing a zine called Comedy Matters in 1999. Um, this online magazine, it was very new in those days. And they said, like, Jeffrey, you know everybody in comedy. Why don't you write a column? So I decided to call it Comedy Matters. And I started covering the comedy scene and I go out to the clubs and I knew the managers and I knew the owners and I don't even remember how I met all these people. I just knew, know everybody, right? So um, one night I was invited to this show his, by his manager, I believe. Okay. Jason, a guy named Jason Steinberg was handling him at the time. And uh, I went to the show and his presence was amazing. I saw this guy. He was much more than a comedian. He was a comedy philosopher. Okay. He had a real point of view, you know, and there was something so special about him. And I wrote articles about him. I was really just drawn to him. You know, he'd been like an ex-football player. The guy was huge, you know? He's big. He was such a big dude. I used to tell him, when we come out on stage, you should come out holding me in your arms. <laughs> you know? and, and we had this amazing connection from the first time we met. You know, we used to like embrace each other. We always uh, hug each other. And, you know, Patrice had a reputation. Like if comics would come up against him, he would rip him apart verbally. You know, you could you couldn't like comics tend to be sometimes They'll be like very immature guys, always ripping on each other, right, right, right. saying saying shit about each other, you know. And um, Patrice, he wouldn't have that, man. He would like tear them down because he could do that. It was very easy for him to do that. He and I never had that relationship. It was always very supportive. Okay. If you listen to the Black Phillip show, there were times when we didn't agree on like how to approach women and stuff because I could never say the stuff that he would say and uh -huh. he could say the stuff that I would say. He's like, Jeffrey, when you talk magical butterflies of people, <laughs> you know, he's like, he would always kid me about stuff like that. But we had this very, I couldn't even really explain. It was a very intense bond. We both really respected each other. That's awesome. You know, and it was, it was, it was really very deep. At his funeral, his, his uh, wife, Von De Carla, came over and she was like, you know, Patrice really loved you. Uh -huh. like, that was so meaningful to me. I said, yeah, it was mutual. You know, we had a, just a lot of respect for each other and we never came at each other that way. There was no making fun of each other. He would joke about me, you know, in a, but in a nice, friendly way. Yeah, OK, OK. And so um, so when we did our first show, you know, and I have it, I have the recording and you could probably find it on my channel. But he called me at four or five in the morning to tell me that he was so excited about the show that we did that he wanted us to do our own show. Hey. But he was so humble. I carry that on my phone. I have it with me because it's an unbelievable honor to me. I have it on my phone. And, and he said he was so humble that he said, I don't want to assume anything as if I might not want to do it, right? Mm -hmm. Because they want me to do my own show anyway. But I think that show that you and I did would be phenomenal. Yeah. And unfortunately, he passed away before we were able to do that. But just the idea that he was so taken, he couldn't wait to call me. He called me at 4.05 in the morning. And I have that on the recording. Yeah. And I'm pretty sure that it's on my YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Gurian News Network. G-N-N. R-I-A-N, Gurian News Network. And if you search for Patrice phone call, it should come up. Okay. I put it up with a lot of pictures of me and Patrice because I was with him at his last taping when he did Elephant in the Room. That's a great comedy session. Yeah, and he had Harris Stanton open for him, and I was backstage. That's the first time he introduced me to his mom. I got ah. 
to meet his mom, Georgia, who I saw recently, you know, for the last seven years since he passed away, Bill Burr does a tribute to him every year oh. at a place called Town Hall in New York City. And it holds a few thousand people and it's always sold out. And then afterwards, there's an after party. You know, he and Bill Burr were very close. Yeah. And Bill Burr and this comedy executive named Maureen Tarrant, they do this show every year. And so Patrice's mom, Georgia, was there. And this year she called me over and she's like, Jeffrey, can we get a picture together? And I'm like, absolutely. It was so amazing. She was there with one of her daughters. And even she knew how tight me and Patrice were. Okay, okay. It was, it was amazing. And they were doing a, uh, a documentary on him that I got interviewed for. I don't know what stage it's at in production, but they were doing a documentary about his life. And Sounds awesome. I have some rare footage of him because he used to let me he used to let me bring my camera up to the XM studios where we did Black Phillip. I got video of those things that nobody oh, man, that's awesome. Nobody has that. Me and Dante Nero and uh, and him and I used to bring models up to the show. He used to like that because he liked my taste in women. Hey. So I would bring these models up to the show and I would warn them before Patrice is gonna He's going to try and take away all your power. Just be cool with it. You know what I mean? Because he would, you know, he loved women. People thought he hated women, but that's not true at all. He loved women. He hated how men became weak around beautiful women. That we lost all our power. We gave our power away, you know? And he thought it should be even, you know? And so his wife, she actually wrote a book called uh, I Speak Fluent Man. Because Patrice taught her how a man likes to be treated. Okay. She agreed with it. And she said herself, she goes, it doesn't take anything away from a woman. You could still be a strong, independent woman and still treat your man well. And so th those are the kind of things that we used to talk about on the show. It was an amazing show. And I can't tell you, I still get love from people. That show was like 2008, man. Yeah, man. Yeah. Started collecting in the past couple of weeks. How many messages I got on Instagram? Okay. From guys who said what you guys did changed my life. So many times people wrote that that it changed their life listening to that show. It was amazing because at the time you're doing it, you don't realize how it affects people. Right, right. For what they're hearing. But it was a very powerful show, man. Yeah. And, uh, I started collecting all those messages. I put them into a folder because it, it, it really amazed me. Instagram is the thing these days, obviously. That it you is, know definitely. Know that. So I hope some of your listeners will connect with me on Instagram. Yeah. At Jeffrey Gurian. Sure enough. Yeah, but, but Insta I, like, I'm telling you, I've been getting a few messages a week ah. from people who are fans of Black Phillip. Okay. So that was a very special time for me. Yeah, yeah. It was, it was horrible that he passed away so young. He was only 41 years old. That is young, man. But you can see so many videos of him, you know, when he was at the Charlie Sheen roast. I think that was one of his last roasts. Where he that just, was the, that's like one, one of the best ones. He was hilarious on that one. So hilarious. And you know what? He never pandered. He never he, pandered. Exactly. He never did. You're right about that. People, you know, he could have probably gone a lot further in his career if he gave in to the industry because he was so outrageous. But he never would. He stuck to what he wanted to do. Right. To and, you know, it, it's funny. And he showed up for me in so many ways. Um, it's so funny. I was talking about this the other night. I'm probably one of the only white guys that was ever honored for Black History Month. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, that. <laughs> Me and Danny Simmons, Russell Simmons' brother, I, I was honored for Black History Month for creating comedy workshops for inner city kids. Okay. And we had an event. It was held at Hunter College in New York City. But um, I did this event at Gotham Comedy Club, and Patrice showed up with a lot of friends of mine. A lot of black comics came to support. Um, and it was really an amazing event. And Patrice yeah. did Patrice did about 45 minutes on stage. Hey, okay. And I'm pretty sure I have that too. I was filming that day. Uh, he showed up for me all the time, man. He would come in, you know, for, I believe he was in New Jersey at the time, and he drove in 
to support because he knew awesome. what I was doing and because we were very close. So I'd that, say, that was a very special relationship. Yeah. I said, people would love to see those videos, man. I don't know if you feel like uploading them, but on YouTube, man, people would love to see that stuff. Some of it's there. Okay. When I interviewed him, he did one of the lottery shows, the last lottery shows. If they go to my channel, uh-huh. uh, and again, it's youtube.com slash Gurian News Network. Okay. G-U-R-I-A-N as a Nancy, Gurian News Network. You'll see tons of videos with comedians. But if you search for Patrice, yeah, yeah, yeah. all of those are going to come up. Okay, awesome. You'll see some of that stuff. And you'll see the Patrice phone call. and Because it's got, not only will you hear the call, but you'll see a lot of pictures of me and Patrice. Okay. Backstage and hanging out and, you know, doing all kinds of stuff. I want to I wanna ask you this, man. I don't want to, like, you know, turn this conversation bad. But um, tell me, wh- what was his funeral like? What was that like? It was very... First of all, everybody in comedy was there. When I came in, and I remember this very clearly, there was a special room for family and friends, for very close family. I didn't go in. I didn't want to impose. I didn't know. It was a, it, it was a, a shock. You know, he had been, he had been lingering for six weeks. He was, um, he had a stroke, and he was paralyzed. And I couldn't find out if people were visiting him or not. But, but. At the funeral, I remember there was this room, and when I came in, they said, "You want to go in?" I said, "No, I, I just felt I don't want to. I don't want to push myself in there. I just felt weird about it." So I went and I sat in one of the rows, in one of the pews, but I was on the aisle. And when they wheeled his uh, his coffin down the aisle, that's when Van de Carlo said that to me. Where as she walked by me, she goes, "You know, he really loved you." And it was a very touching moment, you know, and so many of the comedians were there, Colin Quinn and Bill Burr and Jim Norton, you know, all his friends who were on um, Colin Quinn's show, Tough Crowd, you know, Patrice, you know, he held court on that show. I think yeah, Nick yeah. was there, you know, I'm pretty sure Nick DiPaolo was there, but it was a lot of comedians came, you know, to pay their respects. And it was a, it was a very sad but a very special day. Yeah. Big turn, big turnout. Yeah, okay, I understand. And so, and so, um, you know, you. St- I'm, I'm curious. Uh, how can I say this? Um, and you had the relationship with him and everything. Uh, did did anything come from that? Like afterwards, did you have you have you always been like a relationship guru, or did you kind of stop doing that at all? Doing what? I guess kind of like a relationship advice. Were you, were you always a relationship guru? Or relationship? Or? Oh, well, <clears throat> I started doing some episodes on the Beige Philip show. Dante Nero went on to, to create his own podcast called the Beige Philip show. <laughs> and uh, it's always good when I see Dante. We're good friends. And so we would talk about relationships there as well. He did the show with a guy named Harry Turjanian. And I would join them occasionally. And I still see him. He does a lot of advice stuff. I haven't been doing much of that. I do other kind of coaching. You know, um, I was a very severe stutterer. And I stuttered so badly. I stuttered well into my 20s and even beyond. I stuttered so bad I couldn't even say my name. Oh, wow. And I can never say Gurian. Most stutterers have a hard time saying their name. And I'm always grateful when I get a chance to talk about it because I cured myself. My parents took me for speech therapy and no one was able to help me. Mm. And I realized one day that I didn't stutter when I was alone. I only oh. stuttered when I was trying to talk to somebody else. And that, that happens to be true for a lot of stutterers. Not all, but a lot of stutterers can say every word perfectly if they're in a room by themselves. But as soon as they try to talk to somebody else, they stutter. So that told me that there was really nothing wrong with me. I consider it grace. I was given the grace to figure out there's really nothing wrong with me because you can't have a disability based on your location, right? Right, right, all right. If a man has a limp, he limps in every room of his house. He can't go into a room and close the door and walk perfectly, right? But if I could speak perfectly when I'm alone, then it means that theoretically, I should be able to speak perfectly all the time. Right. There's really nothing wrong with me. Like, so I used to use humor to figure it out. Like I said, well, what if I'm in a room 
and I think I'm by myself, and I'm speaking perfectly, but somebody's hiding in the room, and I don't know they're there, and suddenly they pop up. How fast do I have to start stuttering? Do I have to start stuttering immediately? Can I give myself five minutes, you know? And I started thinking all these thoughts that made it not make sense to me. I'm like, why stutter at all? So I developed a technique for teaching myself, for changing my mind, which I used in this new book that I have on happiness that I'm sure we're going to get to. But, of but I, 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 uh, I developed a technique of changing your thoughts because somewhere along the way I created thoughts to sabotage myself and I developed a stuttering technique to hold myself back from achieving goals in life. I knew I wanted to be a doctor, but how many stuttering doctors are there? You don't, when, when you see somebody stuttering, you don't look at them as a calm, confident person. And when you go to a doctor, you want to have confidence in your doctor. Yeah, yeah. Right? And if a man is stuttering, whether he's confident or not, it looks like he's not. So I was determined not to go through my whole life as a stutterer. So I worked on myself for years, and I took my mind apart. I basically examined all my thoughts. And I realized that a lot of us are holding thoughts that are not valid for us. They're, very often they're thoughts that are negative about ourselves, and they're thoughts that were given to us by other people, many of whom did not have our best interests at heart. So if you were ever bullied as a kid, and many kids were bullied, because kids can be cruel, if you were the kid who the other kids felt didn't fit in in some way, and they said mean things to you, even though you didn't want to believe it, on some level you hold on to those thoughts. If any, anytime anyone ever broke a promise to you or hurt your feelings in some way or broke up with you in a relationship, we carry those pains inside of us, and I call them heart wounds. And we need to release those heart wounds in order to create, in order to achieve happiness in your life, because those heart wounds affect your self-esteem, they affect yeah, your yeah. self-confidence, and they affect every decision you make in your life. Every time you have to make a decision, you think about what you should do. You use your thoughts, because who else's thoughts can you use? But if your thoughts are not healthy, if your thoughts are negative, your decisions are not going to work out for you. And that's what made me write this book my book on happiness this yeah, yeah. it's called healing your heart by changing your mind and the reason it says healing your heart is getting rid of those heart wounds that we all carry that give us negative messages tells you you're not good enough you're not this you're not that you're not talented enough you're not smart enough and a lot of those things are bs they're not true so you have to examine your thoughts objectively and see what thoughts are not true for you that you're holding and let them go release them and that's why i put a dog on the front a meditating dog can you see that clearly carefully i've seen i've seen the coverage a, definitely. Dog. a dog in lotus position you know how hard it is to get a dog to go in lotus <laughs> position so so i wrote this book and it, it it became a bestseller on amazon and because it's resonating with people it's resonating with people because when you read it, you understand that everybody's basically the same. We're all holding thoughts that are not valid for us. Yeah. And our thoughts hold us back. You know? And in order to achieve happiness, we have to literally change your mind. Uh, you have to change the way you think. So I did that. And as you can see, I no longer stutter. Yeah. I use my voice in everything I do. Or if I'm on the radio, if I'm on TV, if I'm talking to people, I lecture, I do all kinds of stuff with my voice. I coach, I teach stutterers how not to stutter. Mm -hmm. So if there are people out there listening to this who know somebody who stutters or stutters themselves, there are at least three million people in this country that stutter. They should look on my website and read about stuttering. And if it, okay. makes, sense, if it makes sense to them, which is what I tell people, I don't advertise, I don't look for business that way. But people find me, if you look on my website, which is ComedyMattersTV.com. You can ignore all the show business stuff because there's plenty of showbiz stuff. But if you look under the About column, there's one menu that says About, and you'll see it says Cure for Stuttering. Look at that. And if that resonates with you, if, if it makes sense to you, then my technique will probably help you. 
Mm-hmm. Well, I want to ask you. I want to ask you. Can you um? Can you give me any any practical advice for starters right now? Well, it's it's the confidence. First of all, check yourself. Every stutterer knows if they can speak fine when they're alone, then there's really nothing wrong with them. They created mm-hmm. it in their mind, and as soon as people put you in a class with other stutterers, you accept the fact that there's something wrong with you. Okay. Stutterers think that there's something wrong with them. I did. When they put me in speech class with other stutterers, it made me worse because it made me feel like there was really something wrong with me. Right, right. You know, there's a, uh, I'm sorry about the phone. Uh, It should stop in a minute. There's a... Let me see if I can turn that off. You edit this stuff, right? You can edit out the phone call, right? Definitely, definitely. So... Well, I, I said, this is wait on it then. We'll, we'll wait on it. Okay, so there's a thing about, it's called the serenity prayer. And the serenity prayer says, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, right. the courage to change the things I can, and the, and the wisdom to know the difference. Let me turn this off. The serenity prayer says, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the most important line, and the wisdom to know the difference. Right. That's the most important thing. If I, didn't, if I wasn't given the grace to have the wisdom to know the difference, I'd still be stuttering today. Some things you have to change. There are things about ourselves that you can't change. You can't change your genetics, right? You can't change a lot of stuff about us that you exactly. can change uh, physically. But there are certain things that you can change, and that gives you the freedom to work towards changing those things. And so it's important for people to know they need hope. A lot of stutterers have tried a lot of things that didn't work for them, and they lose hope. But I'm here to give them hope, because if I can do it, you could do it. Of course. That's the spiritual aspect. We're all the same, man. We look different. We have different names. But we're all the same. We're built the same. We got the same 46 chromosomes. Exactly. You know, everything works the same. So I didn't do magic. I just worked really hard. I was obsessed with getting better. And I cured myself. And I consider it a cure. A lot of people don't like to use the word cure. I feel that I'm cured. I could stutter again tomorrow, but I refuse to. I won't let myself. Okay, that's awesome. I won't let myself. So... You know, hopefully, if there are people out there who stutter or who know somebody who does, let this give you hope that you can get better. Because, as I said, if I did it, you can do it too. I want to ask you this, man. Is there, um, can you give me any practical advice for, you know, healing those heart wounds? Well, <clears throat> it's a process. You know, when people say advice, uh, the best thing they can do is to read my book. And I'm not just saying that because I want people to buy my book. And it's available also, you know, as an ebook, as a paperback, and also as an audio book. Because some people like awesome. to Yeah, and I, I like audio books. That's definitely I'll good. I'll tell you that quick story because I manifested it. It was so weird. I did the ebook and I did the paperback. And I wanted to do an audio book, but it was kind of overwhelming to me because it's a whole process. If you do it yourself, you got to find the studio, you got to hire engineers. You got to record it and then you have to edit it and stuff. Right, and right, right. It's a big deal, man. Just writing a book is a big deal. I never thought I'd even have a book and I have six books now. Hey. So this was like a very big thing for me. About two weeks after me thinking this, I got an email from one of the biggest companies in the world, Tantor Media, who offered me a contract. They said, we read your book and we really like it. And we think we'd like to do an audio book of your Awesome. That's awesome. So it was like you can manifest certain things by putting out a strong intention to the universe. You can make things happen that way. It's it's very interesting to me. So um, there's no simple way to tell people how to get rid of heart wounds. Mm. Knowledge is power. The more you know, the more powerful you become. And what I do in the book is I break it down into many different sections how to start your day, how to surround yourself with things that make you happy, how to evaluate your thinking, 
you know, it's not a simple one answer thing like two and two is four. Okay. It's, it's a complicated process and you have to be dedicated to changing your life, to being tired of living the way you're living. And you just know that there's a better way. Right, right. And you have to want that for yourself. Okay. Because self-sabotage is very popular. A lot of us get really close to something and then we mess it up at the, at the last minute. We do something to sabotage it because so, on some deep level, we don't feel that we deserve success, mm. you know? And so that's a very important thing. So yeah, yeah. I would just advise people to look at the book. There's a, there are samples okay. of it. You don't even have to buy it right away. Just look on Amazon and either put in my name or put in Healing Your Heart by Changing Your Mind, a spiritual and humorous approach to achieving happiness. And let me just say briefly about spirituality. It has nothing to do with religion there. Absolutely nothing. Because religion can be wonderful for people, but it puts us into a category, and other people are automatically outside that category. So it separates us. Spirituality mm -hmm. brings us together because all it asks is that you believe in a force greater than yourself. And you could call it nature or the universe or God, whatever you want to call it, whatever's comfortable to you as long as you realize it isn't you. Because when you think that you are the one controlling your life, you blame yourself when things don't go the way you want them to go. You start thinking, well, I should have said this, I could have done that, if I had only thought of this. Meanwhile, it wasn't meant to be. It was not your path. And again, it's because you're supposed to have something better than what you thought you wanted. Otherwise, you tend to blame yourself and you try to start micro-manipulating the universe, which you can't do. You can't make things happen that are not supposed to happen. And I've learned that the hard way. A lot of things fall through. Like that story with Patrice. We would have had an amazing show. You know, it's such, Definitely. such a shame that he had to die so young. You know, he had to leave us. But we could have had an incredible show and he wanted to do it. It wasn't like me going to him and say, Hey Patrice, we should really do a show. He's like, he called me and said that mm -hmm. we should have a show together. It was that the dynamic was incredible and it would be amazing. Yeah, man, that would have been amazing. Those are things that you have to handle in life. It was meant to be, it would have happened. You know, some things are not supposed to happen for whatever reason. You can never figure out the reason. Right. You have to make yourself comfortable with it. I wanna um I wanna I wanna I wanna kinda switch things up on you, uh, Jeffrey. I wanna I wanna ask you uh these couple of, like rapid fire questions and I want you to try and answer them and we'll say like uh thirty seconds or less. Can we do that? Yeah, sure. Awesome. You think you're ready? I'm always ready. Yeah, <laughs> sure enough. Um if you could meet anyone dead or alive, who would it be? Uh Ooh, anyone dead or alive? Wow, those those are always hard questions for me. W. C. Fields. Okay, was yeah, an no. inspiration to me. He was the okay. funniest dude ever. Died before I was born. Okay. I think uh, I like to meet him. Yeah. Well, what is the best gift you've ever received? My children. Okay, so sure enough. Uh, why did the chicken cross the road? I guess he had to. I don't know. I <laughs> sure enough. <laughs> If you had one superpower, what would it be? Flying. Hey, I like it. I like it. What is one item you could never live without? Mm, one item I could never live without. I hate to say it, my cell phone. Sure enough. I understand <laughs> that, man. Yeah, it's crazy. <laughs> what advice would you give your 25-year-old self? Mm, that's interesting. What advice would I give my 25-year-old self? Uh, do exactly what I did. I can't see making any changes. Just uh, persevere and work hard to achieve your dreams. Okay, so sure enough, so sure enough. Uh, what is the best piece of advice you've ever received? <clears throat> when I'm on stage, some famous comedian once told me, he goes, if you think you're going too slow, slow down. Uh -huh. that, was, that was a good piece of advice. That's the only piece of advice. I haven't gotten, interestingly enough, I know you only want the brief answers, but 
I haven't gotten a lot of advice that stuck with me. I've gotten a lot of support from people. Okay. Okay. But that particular saying, because there's a tendency on stage to want to keep speaking and telling jokes and being afraid of the silence. I... And one of the greats told me, don't let that bother you. If you think you're going too slow, slow down. You're never going too slow. Mm. The audience wants to hear what you have to say. Some right. guys speak so fast, the audience doesn't get a chance to react to what you're saying. So as a performer, that was important advice for me. Yeah, I definitely understand that. I, I want to ask you the opposite of that. Um, I believe you say you haven't gotten much advice, but what is the worst piece of advice you've received? I don't recall getting any bad advice. If I don't, if I don't like it, I don't use it. Okay, so no. Yeah, I've, I've always been kind of strong-willed, and I did a lot of stuff on my own. Okay. So I didn't have a lot of people to guide me. I would have loved to have a mentor, but I never really had one. Mm. So it wasn't like I got a lot of advice from people. I got a lot of advice from my own experience, seeing what works and what doesn't work. Okay, okay. Uh, last one, Jeffrey. Um, let's say you're stuck on an island for five days and you can only bring three items. What would you bring? Stuck on an island for three days? For, for... Uh, five days and you can only bring three things. What would you bring? Stuck on... I mean, I'm going to be rescued after five days? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Definitely. So I bring my hair, my hair dryer <laughs> <laughs> and an outlet to plug it in. Okay, that's two things. My cell phone. I'll give you one more. And uh, a beautiful woman. Hey, all right, so sure enough. <laughs> easy as that. Yeah, easy as that. <laughs> so, as you know, Jeffrey did a, a great job on those questions, man. I appreciate it. Thank you, man. Thank you so yeah. much. And so, I, I guess, really, man, Jeffrey, um, and I guess at this point, I just really want to thank you, man, for taking time out here to talk to me, man. No, you're a good host, Terrence. I enjoyed it. I opened up a lot to you, and uh, and I like the idea that you uh, that you were kind enough to invite me on, even though you only talk to dancers usually. Right. I said I was thinking this is a little bit different for me, but I'm so glad I had you on, man. But it was very nice, you know. As I said when we started, all artists share a similar thing, you know. When it comes to the heart, people get it. It doesn't matter what your art is, whether you're drawing or singing or acting dancing, doing comedy. You're all basically the same kind of person. So I think people could relate to the things that we talked about. Of course, of course. So we talked about stuff on a heart level. Yeah. And and that carries over. I look at comedy as a healing force. Um, comedy brings everybody together. Yes. That was one of the things I really dug about working with Patrice. We had a very multicultural audience. Mm. And I will say this too. I was one of the only... <laughs> I. I I was the opening act for the Martin Luther King Comedy Festival. Okay, so no. In Bedside, Brooklyn, right? And I was probably the only white guy in the room. And I thank the audience specifically because I do look at comedy as a healing force and it brings all of us together. And anytime you can sit together and laugh at things together yeah. and then laugh at yourself, it makes the world a better place. Right, right. You know? And I truly believe that. It's very, it's why Russell Peters is so popular, you know, the Indian comedian, and he's got a very multi-ethnic audience, and he imitates every accent in the world, and laughs at people, and everybody's laughing and having a great time, and that's how it's supposed to be. Yeah. You know? So I appreciate you, and I appreciate you asking me to come on, and I hope a lot of people get to listen to this. Oh, I'm excited, man. Well, real quick, can, man, can you? Can I just mention my contact? Of course, I was going to ask you, exactly, yeah, please, go ahead. So my website is ComedyMattersTV.com. ComedyMattersTV.com. You'll see all kinds of fun stuff on there with Nick Roll and John Mulaney. I was the first guy to get pranked with Too Much Tuna on Broadway, the big tuna fish sandwich. Uh, yes, yeah. <laughs> Comedy Central. And uh, you'll see all kinds of fun stuff on there. Uh, my YouTube channel, again, is YouTube.com slash Gurian News Network. And that's called Comedy Matters TV. But it's on Gurian News Network. And uh, on Twitter and Instagram, it's at Jeffrey Gurian, J-E-F-F-R-E-Y. The R comes first for all you people who want to spell it E-R-Y. That doesn't work. It's J-E-F-F-R-E-Y. Like Jeffrey, Jeffrey Gurian. And on Twitter and Instagram and on Facebook, Jeffrey Gurian. Check me out. 
send me a message and we'll connect. And, and so then, when I when I upload this, Jeffrey, I'm gonna make sure I put all your uh, all your links, all your information, you know, the book information, all all in the description and everything. I got you. Awesome, thank you, man. Appreciate yes, it. Of course, man. I want to ask you, Jeffrey. Um, do you have any events coming up in your life? Like, what do you have going on? You think soon? Uh, I just got well. I'm performing all over town, you know, in different clubs. But where are you based? Uh, so I, I'm in uh, New Orleans, Louisiana. New Orleans. I never made it there. I want to get there someday. Really? Okay, man. I have not been there. So wow. so many clubs in New Orleans want me to want, want me to headline, come down, you know. Hey, hey, hey. I'm headlining in Ohio, but that's not till September. And I'm, okay. I'm doing some big event in November. I'm hosting a big event for a guy who works with cancer patients. Okay. Um, he's a, a nutritionist and herbalist named Donnie Yance, and they're doing a big event in New York City. He's in Oregon. He has a big foundation there, and they work to cure cancer. And because of my background as a doctor and also in comedy, they uh, they have me hosting their big event next November. Okay. So that's a big thing coming up. Yeah, man. But um, people could check my Facebook page and see where I'm performing. Sure enough. I said, if your comedy clubs in Louisiana, I'm sure there are a bunch of them. Yeah, you want yeah. To down, hit me up. Got you. Down, yeah. Some laughs together. Hey, 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 hey. Like I said, Jeffrey, man, I want to really appreciate you. You know, just taking time to talk to me. I really appreciate that, Jeffrey. Thank you, Terrence. It was great being on with you, and uh, wish you all the best. You're a good. Uh, thank host. you so much. Hey, I appreciate that, Jeffrey. I want to say, you know, man, just enjoy the rest of your day, Jeffrey. All right. You too, bro. Take care. All right, all right, Jeffrey. Bye bye. <laughs> That's all it is. Hey everyone, uh, if you made it this far to all to the end of the video, I want to thank you so much. Um, my overall goal with making these interviews and these episodes is uh, to give a voice to dancers. You know, to give them a platform to speak their story. So, uh, if this is of value to anyone, then that that means the world to me. Um, my overall goal is to give value to the dance community. So if you find no value in this, and I, I urge you to please let me know where I can improve on. Um, I, I truly want to, you know, just uh, give value and content to to the dance community. Um, so please let me know how I can improve, where I'm messing up, because to be 100% honest with you, um, you know, I'm learning along the way as I do this. I, I truly am. So um, to be able to interact with, you know, the dance community, it means the world to me because it, it gives me feedback and it lets me know, you know, what I'm doing right, where I can improve upon, um, you know, what I'm doing wrong, which I feel like might maybe more important. Um, so please, if you all could could comment and just let me know what you think, it, it means the world to me because, you know, that feedback just helps me improve. So um, please comment uh, as well, you know, please like and subscribe. That means a lot as well. Um, but, you know, I want to say thank you so much for for just watching this because it means the world to me. Um, you know, I want to I want to take you on this journey of the Two Love Feet podcast. You know, I'm, I'm very excited for it. So once again, thank you so much.